that is so different than out here where we just, we're like, what's the one thing? And this goes back to that point of peace and prosperity. Philosophers will say, well, you should have both. Prosperity isn't a billion dollars. Prosperity is, do your means supersede your desires? So you can either get that by upping your means or decreasing your desires. Peace is, does your understanding supersede your conflict? Mm. Not the other way around. If your conflict supersedes your understanding, that's not peace. Welcome to the uh, to my podcast that's gaining major traction, my groundbreaking podcast called Off Limits. And uh, it's because a lot of the stuff we talk about is off limits. Is this, th- is this washing me out, this, these new bulbs, or do I look good? You look really, really good. That's what I'm talking about. James Bashara, creator of Magic Mind um, and uh, startup investor extraordinaire. Is it okay if we take one before we I, I, dive in? You were about to do it, and I go, let's do this on air because I love this stuff. No chance I'm going to do a podcast without one. I want to talk about... Mm-hmm. I'm not only founder, but I also uh, do drink it. Every well, now day. I'm an investor because I believe in this so much. And one of the things I love about it is my everybody I've ever given it to gets addicted. It's not an addiction like that, but like my wife, who doesn't drink coffee, she brought this to Florida with us. Oh, awesome. And then I well, drank one of hers, and she goes, hey, 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 I only brought enough for me. And well, I was like, "That's when people do that, you go, something's going on. I want to cut you off just to touch on, I'm sure listeners are like, who the hell is this guy? I want to talk about you for um, at least 30 seconds. Nice. So graciously promoted Magic Mind. The reason that you're an investor is because you talked about it for a year. Yeah, because air, I believed constantly. in it because it, it worked. And we didn't even know each other. You were just talking about it. And then we got put in touch. Um, or no, we met at Casablanca. Yeah. Do you remember what you and said to me? No, what I said. It was so cool because I was like feeling down that day. I was going through some stuff. And I was with my daughter and my, my son. And... Uh, you said, Brian Callen, I said, yeah, I said, thank you for, for talking about what's important and making the world right. And I was like, yeah, that's you, such a nice thing to say. Your guest selection for, how long have you been podcasting? 13 years. And your guest selection is, like Eric Prince uh, a few weeks ago, mm-hmm. um, it's awesome, stellar guest selection. How do, well, how do you tap into, from discovering... Jordan Peterson to yeah two weeks ago, the, the, but Jordan Peterson. I, so a lot of the people that really like I, I ended up interviewing initially with uh, my first podcast, and I interviewed some amazing people, including Jordan Peterson twice before. You know, I interviewed Jordan. I think before. Well, I remember Rogan said that that podcast with that guy Jordan Peterson was great. I go get him on yesterday because that guy's amazing, and what, then the rest is history. That? God, I don't know. That that's got to be. That's got to be 10 years ago. I mean, I don't know, something like yeah, that. Yeah, you're and, so, so ahead and, but, of the curve. But I, I would love to take credit for discovering Jordan Peterson, but my, my friend Hunter Motz did, and he was my partner, and he, would, he was the one who was finding these people. Um, so I wish I could take credit for it, but I can't. But, um, but I've always been good at, I think, just knowing when somebody's smarter than I am or has way more to offer or at least has something to offer I don't have. And so now what I do is, like with someone like Eric Prince, we had done a CrossFit class in Vegas – and then we got to talk and we took a car back together and uh, he was just really cool. And I, I was kind of making him laugh because I found out he had 12 children. So I looked at him, I go, 12 kids. Wait, he was wearing he did, shorts. He has 12 yeah. kids? Yeah. He's got three. His first wife passed away from cancer. He had four children with her and that was tough. That's why he left the seals. Hmm. And then he married another woman and then they got divorced. He had three kids with her, I think. And then he had, then he got married to his wife's best friend later on. And now he has four Ish. children. Yeah. So he's still with her and she's, I met her. She's a badass. But, um, but it's a great, it is a great episode. But for, I just liked him because he was, he, I was like looking at him and I, you know, he, I'm looking at this former Navy SEAL is about my age, way better shape than I am. We're doing this CrossFit class and I was like, Jesus, just kind of this big, you know, kind of, kind of tough guy. And, but I was making him laugh though. Literally, we were in the car and I go, 12 kids? And he's, yeah, I go, take your pants off. Let me see what you're working with right now. And he started laughing. And then we was just, then we ended up talking. And then we were there and I was going to breakfast. I go, you want to grab breakfast? And he's like, well, let me check with my wife. And then he came in and we, but he's one of those disciplined guys. He wasn't eating his, I ate a lot yesterday. I'll just have a cappuccino, you know? Mm -hmm. So anyway, long story short, I was so impressed with the way he was speaking about foreign policy from his perspective 
that I, and it was rather controversial, you know, that I, I said, we have to podcast. So well, I always want to talk to people who have different ideas. Yeah, it is uh, genuinely, genuinely impressive how you can work from mathematicians to theological philosophers to uh, well, Black you know, you and I got close to, because what I thought was very impressive, <laughs> yeah, <us. laughs> yeah. Well, that what I what I thought was impressive with you. Uh, this is funny how you how you can somebody can say one thing and you realize that you're connected. So you said something really interesting to me, which was you said two things that you said a number of things. I'm going to go through all of them. One was um, I said to you, "Look, you're 34 at the time, or whatever, and you've made enough money to not worry. You, you're self sufficient. You have money." You're, a, you're one of those startup San Francisco dudes who hit it. And, you know, I saw you, I saw that you were one of the, you know, Naval Ravikant's one of your mentors and he created an angel list and you the were best like, angel investor of, of all time, uh, in my, in my yeah, opinion. I've been listening to Ravikant. He's amazing. Um, but you said, I said, now that you have all this money, what do you want to do? And you said, I want to get closer to God. Mm. And I thought that was really cool. And then you the only person in, in LA that would, I would think that was cool, but yeah, well, but the because then we got into, we got into the conversations that I like talking about that don't make for popular podcasts mm -hmm. necessarily, you know, but, but we started talking about the things that I care about, which are maybe you could ca categorize as, uh, transcendent truths, mm -hmm. you know, or how do we get closer to those kind of truths versus man-made truths, Transcendent truths, you know, the, these sort of truths that seem to be apart from the human experience. And, uh, and, and maybe even foundational truths. And maybe even foundational Not truths. Just transcending where we are, but foundational to that work meeting you don't want to have in an uh, hour. I mean, that's, it is so relevant to that hard conversation, the avoidance of a hard conversation, the uncertainty of how your Friday is going to go, the uncertainty in your personal life. It is so... It is so foundational that uh, I think the, the biggest misconception about something like philosophy or thinking about the subject of God is that it's like a last step instead of like, like I'm wearing a jacket right now with a, a, a zipper. And there's, I don't know, 200 teeth to this zipper. And if I'm trying to align all of them and let's say I start the zipper halfway up. If I start at three, three quarters of the way up. If I start on the wrong spot, that is, that's hellish work to get them to align. You start at the right spot, start right on the right foundation. You can zip up 200 teeth. They align perfectly. And it's essentially effortless. So it, I think it is, uh, it's part of the, the misconception I know you you didn't mean it that way of uh, transcendent uh, being you know the last step, but the part of the misconception is like, well, let me you know I've got my hierarchy of needs, and let me get these foundational things down pat first, then I'll think about that shit. Mm. And that is like saying like, okay, I'll, I'll think about the the bottom of the zipper like last. Yeah, let me just jam do these things together. Yeah. So I just want to call it that. It's in my view, it's foundational too. An investment I may I might make five hours from now. Um, it's as foundational, relevant to that as a conversation with Naval uh, the night before or something. Well, you you I love that I love that because what you're talking about in many ways is perspective and principles, not rules, but perspective and principles. Um, you could I'm, I'm, that's not just what you're talking about, but you can you can extrapolate from that the idea that to really learn how to do something. You've got to understand the principles therein. You've got to understand um, the foundation, right? So, so whether you're wrestling, whether you're boxing, whether you're playing right. the guitar, there's always a foundation. There is a you have to you have to have a strong foundation that you establish. But you know, you said to me another thing that you said to me was. Um, in, in, and by the way, just just very quickly, what I like about Magic Mind. And what I thought was very interesting is it came out of necessity for you. Here you were running this company. All of a sudden you have this, you find out you have a heart condition. You're on a gurney. You can't drink coffee anymore because you're drinking 10 coffees a day. 
and you go, only you, of course, you're like, this is the kind of person you're like, I can't drink coffee. Let me invent my own kind of coffee now. Let me go beyond coffee. Mm -hmm. I read that book. First time I met you, you gave me that book. So um, that's why I trust you. That's kind of like, that's why I trust the product because you take it yourself. And I was like, do you see what I mean? So, so, yeah. so again, like you, this company kind of this company's now doing really well. But the reason that, the, the, I guess the reason I invested was primarily because the the foundation therein came about not just organically but for the right reasons like it's real like it's it's a, it's not a gimmick it's what you take as the founder and i guess that's yeah it's uh, thank you and and um for people that might want the uh the cliff notes version of the of the company and then we definitely don't have to make it a i'm not trying to make this a, I'm, not, yeah, I'm, I'm not making it a happy commercial to, to see, yeah was, because i have a feeling there might be one or two listeners out there that are finding themselves in a similar spot as myself now is 11 years ago but 11 years ago in the er my heart was beating uh had been beating at 175 beats per minute for three weeks I thought I had uh, butterflies in my stomach. Holy shit. And, uh, and it wasn't butterflies in my stomach for three weeks because I was like, man, this feeling usually goes away. But it's, it's been a and week, you didn't, two And you weeks. couldn't feel that your heart was beating that fast? No, it's beating so fast you don't feel it. Damn. I mean, it's three beats a second. So you don't feel, if it's beating you know, hard at 90 beats uh, a minute, then you're feeling the bump, 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 bump. If it's at 175, it's... Brrr, like a so hummingbird. You, yeah, so you just feel what felt for me is like, this feels like butterflies. Um, and I remember six months before that, it just kind of skipping beats here and there feeling like that was a little bit off feeling like when I drink and I was drinking six, to seven cups of coffee a day. Um, talk about just like starting the zipper in the wrong place and jamming thing. I was building my company at the time. I was 26. We had 50 employees, had no idea what I was doing and just thought, let me just drink another coffee and another coffee and another coffee. Before I knew it, it was like the joke around the office was just, I was drinking six, to seven cups of coffee or Red Bulls a day. And 11 years ago, we had no idea. I had no idea that there was any biological downside to drinking that much. Every once in a while, I'd Google it because I'd be like, this doesn't seem right. Yeah, and I'm shaking. Yeah. I can shake from point A to point B. And I'm like, doesn't feel right. But I would Google and, and there'd be like, I remember specifically remember a CNN money article saying you can have up to five cups of coffee. And they had tested it for like two weeks. So it was like the shittiest study probably Six done people. by the Coffee yeah. Growers Association of America. But I remember being like, okay, I don't want to find out the truth. A scene in, when I look back and I was completely Call scientifically illiterate. Yeah, I was like back then I was like, why did I trust CNN money? That makes no sense. But, about biology. Yeah, about biology. And yet I wanted to believe I was kind of doing the right things because once I did develop this, this heart condition and my doctor um, about an hour before going to the ER, which is across the street from the doctor's office uh, where he told me I had this heart condition, ran these tests, uh, found out that I had... Condition caused by either excess stress, excess caffeine, or excess alcohol, and I didn't really drink, so I was like, okay, well, maybe it's tied to my six, seven cups of coffee a day, and uh, and yeah, the uh, the doctor was like, well, with your condition, and I remember the, the sober look, he just he looked at me, deadpan, he's like, well, with your condition, you really can't have more than eighty milligrams of caffeine a day, and I was like, what what is that? Two cups, three cups? He's like, that's a half a cup of coffee. Fuck you. And like a total addict, I was, yeah, I was like, there is no fucking way. I didn't care about him saying I got a heart condition. I didn't care about us going, him saying we got to go to ER right after You're this. You're juice. Yeah, I was like, there's no fucking way. Just felt the weight of the world that seemingly depended on a really shitty foundation of this extremely addictive and high tolerance building um, chemical compound of caffeine to get through the day. That was like my foundation. And so, yeah, long story medium, it was... Uh, after that, I was like, my engineering brain just went crazy of how can I make these 80 milligrams of caffeine last all day? So you can take Magic Mind alongside your cup of coffee, cup of tea, whatever your current morning ritual is, and it'll make it last all day. And not just that, now 11 years in, it's, um, do you know who Andrew Weil is? Yeah. yeah so got one of the, the best medical researchers in the U.S., maybe globally, um, one of the best medical researcher minds in the world as, as the head of our scientific advisory board. And 
him, myself, and six other uh, doctors, PhDs, uh, medical researchers, have taken what was six years ago my own um, just engineering brain kind of concoction to the best health, energy, and mood improving shot uh, on the well, market. Well, you were talking about, you know, giving up coffee, right? Like, I, I always think about this. Red wine was a huge part of my life. I, and I, and I, as, I've, as I have gone through some stuff over the past three and a half years and I've gotten to be an older man, and, you know, but that's interesting too. You get grayer and you, you, your face changes. You look different. You're just, you don't get the same kind of attention you do in a weird way. You're not as vibrant. You're not, people aren't looking at you with the eyes of, of, sometimes when you're young and you're doing well, you're on a TV show and you're a comic. Dude, I think it's the opposite. My, well, wife, I and I were, that. my wife and I were actually saying this last night um, because, uh, so uh, for listeners, my wife and I have gotten to know Brian over the last uh, three years and from that, that uh, moment at Casablanca where I thought it was like a throwaway comment and I really did genuinely appreciate the fact that so you can say whatever you want about Jordan Peterson and some of the negative critiques can absolutely stick. But what that guy did to speak up in, it, in a him. academic, professional, social situation where he could lose it all and what he did to speak up about what he as a clinical psychologist professionally just thought was wrong, it... Um, even if 40% of what he's saying was, uh, was accurate, I think even harshest critics now, 2024, would say, yeah, there was, there was a lot there from 20, I don't know, 17 to 20, 21 that was, that was appropriate. They needed to be said. But just him having the courage to say it when he had absolutely no no, financial, no professional parachute. incentive to. But he also to had say, no, no parachute. parachute. Yeah, nothing could have lost everything. And he, right, exactly. He said, "I'm more." He said on Rogan, "I'm more than I'm more than my appetites. I am more than this." Yeah, you know. And so that, and that principle, and that that courage to do that. It's it's like uh, anyone you know. I don't know. Steps in the ring for UFC. You might not be a fighter, but if you know, you look at yourself in the mirror and be like, "I would be scared shitless. I wouldn't do that." You can respect the person that's doing something that. You yourself would wonder if you would be able to have the, I, the I te courage to I do texted it. So. Rogan when I saw after his first episode of on Rogan because mm -hmm. I had done the episode. I, I, I and I, I texted him. I said, I, I can't remember the essentially. I said this man is a prophet in the biblical sense. I mean, in, oh, he's wow. he's coming back to the Israelites and saying, hey something is very wrong here get it together right. and it was it's universal he it was, i'm not talking about the judeo christian ethic i'm not talking about being jewish or christian or, or muslim i'm talking about he was elijah he was ezekiel he was this this to me the, the way he was speaking you can make the argument he was prophet like i still think he's a prophet well it's and again like it's you know record anyone for five thousand hours and there are going to be things that you don't believe or that you don't uh, agree with, but that courage is undeniable, undeniably extremely rare, and holy shit, was he right on a lot of things like compelled speech, uh, where it all kind of started, and where he was like, I will die on this hill. Um, the government is not going to compel me. For the first time in history, the government is not going to introduce a bill that's going to compel me and, and everyone else to speak certain words. Yeah. That... And it was almost like an innocuous point to where you're like, is this that big of a deal? And if you went in unbiased for an hour, you'd be like, oh yeah, that that is a very slippery road. So that was undeniable. Of uh, and now I think a few years removed, it's like, oh yeah, that's a bad idea. But his courage to to say that, and then your ability to see him talking about this seemingly small innocuous issue, um, and to chat with him on the podcast, then to tell because I remember Rogan had somewhere said. Yeah, my buddy Brian Callen is, is the reason I, I chat. And it was, you know, on that pod, podcast between Jordan and and, uh, and Joe that Jordan became almost overnight a uh, household name from, you know, a professor to to yeah. this person that kind of got everybody thinking about maybe we're overcorrect, maybe the pendulum is swinging too far. Now, thankfully, and I think every side except for maybe nuts on the left and right that are in the far extremes. I think everyone on every side is like, thankfully we're moving 
the pendulum swinging back. I hope so. And hopefully yeah. it's probably natural that it would have to move back because it's impossible for it to stay to, over there. Yeah. You, well, you can't apply these ideologies on, on the far left at, at the level of detail. Hmm. You know, th th this is, it's not, I don't know how to apply all the rules that you're coming up with on the fly constantly. I don't know how to, how to, if you're going to tell me that I self identify as something and you have to respect it and everything has to stop until you do, Mm -hmm. Your self identity is always changing. I don't know how to. I don't know how to honor that because I don't know what's going on with you, and I don't know who you are, and I don't know if you're putting me on. I don't know if you're crazy. I don't know if you're sincere. I don't know anything. But I can't run a business that way. I can't run a society that way. Mm -hmm. So th there are th so many things that, that are just completely bankrupt on on people on the fringes. They've not exposed themselves mm -hmm. to the best that's been thought and said across a spectrum. And that's the biggest liability that goes on. But I, I was going to talk about how, you know. So anyhow, that was the the background for the audience, just to yeah to hear. That's why I said, hey, thanks for uh, helping. Um, I don't remember the words that I chose, but along those lines of thanks for helping write uh, or balance out. I tried the world a yeah. bit by uh, having Rogan interview. Yeah, man. Listen, it's it's uh, Dr. Pierce. It's always uh, it's it's. It, my, my, sometimes I get frantic with the idea that you have to try to do the best you can to get the good ideas out there so that the good ideas beat the bad ideas. It gets into a larger thing, right? I mean, we can, you know, but when you were talking about coffee and having to give up coffee, part of the thing that you, that, that's interesting about getting older is that you have to practice various forms of self-restriction if you want to keep evolving, if you want to keep growing and and exp and broaden your understanding, part of what makes your life so fun when you're younger is your vices. It could be anything from the the attention you get from your success, the status you get from your success, the power you get from your success, the spoils of your success, sex with beautiful people, great wine, a uh, great meals with lots of attention and you're the center all these things that you kind of like equate with a good time even like when you see a commercial and it's like ah, and you know ah, and you know mm -hmm. the wine and music and again ah, awards and what's kind of if you're lucky if you're lucky if you're lucky you will be put in a position as you get older where um, you have to let go of all that, where where that no longer becomes, it no longer becomes about you. Now it's somebody else's turn to do that, to raise the belt, to get the attention, to raise a glass. And you are in a position of pretty much service, responsibility, and in the position to carry the water. And I feel like that's where I am now. Um, and one of the things that you helped me with was we were talking as usual about philosophy and you said, when are you ready to start? When are you going to stop going a mile wide and an inch deep? When are you ready to go an inch wide and a mile deep with your practice of spirituality or maybe just understanding, which is what kind of brings us to Vedanta and brings us to the idea behind learning how to not be, to not be, totally identify with your your mind your emotions and your body mm -hmm. but rather cultivate the witness and stand on the outside which has been a huge gift well yeah this is and this is uh my favorite subject it's and it's the only subject that once um once i started to learn about it it's not the only one that i that i really want want to talk about but it's it is um for, and again, this might be the one or two listeners out there. In fact, it's said within Vedanta, one in 10,000 will find this interesting. <laughs> yeah, so I know. It, it is, it is, uh, it is such a, um, it seems like it is going to be irrelevant to, to people, but for those one, those one or two that have been searching, that have been going a mile wide and inch deep in whether it's, I'm going to try cold plunging. I'm going to try reading about stoicism. I'm going to try going to church again. I'm going to try uh, whatever it is, intermittent fasting. All of these things, uh, in my view, we're all, we're all attempt we are all attempting to find what is the truth, freedom through form, formlessness through form, after we have experimented with the youth of 
formlessness through formlessness. And we realize, oh shit, that ain't it. Chilling on the couch all day long. Ain't it. Drinking, drinking six drinks a night, going out all the time with friends. Right. That's not it. Private jets to, uh, to Ibiza. And I'm going to say Ibiza because the people that switch just for Ibiza and they take on a Spanish accent makes no sense to me Bro. because they say, oh, you say Los Angeles and then you say Ibiza. That makes no sense. Bro. That makes absolutely no sense. And you're a walking hypocrite. If you're going to say you're Los putting your Angeles foot down over this and shit. then you're going to say Ibiza, then you're a walking hypocrite. So I should and say lo, Los Angeles yeah. and Ibiza. Y at least be consistent. Damn, and España. You, and if someone's inconsistent, wildly inconsistent they like that, be killed. that you can turn your <laughs> ears should. off because whatever you're going to hear they is going to be, be total fashion and whatever they say is going to be out of fashion in well, five years. But well, the, I have a father who, when he, he says things like, I was in Chile and I'm like, hey, bro, you don't speak Spanish. Well, when I was in Uruguay, we, uh, hey, 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 don't do that. Say Uruguay like an American. Right. It's, okay. Um, yeah. But that, that PJ to uh, Ibiza, that feels like, feels like... It's a metric for success, right? Right, it feels like, oh, well, it's, it's also a metric for what feels like freedom. And then you, you do that a few times and you feel like shit afterwards. <laughs> it's so temporary that it might as well have not even happened. Um, really? Yes. And because then you you're somebody to, of, of great means and you, you can speak that way. So, 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 yeah, so expand on that a little bit. Because I want to I read a, something you said to me that I thought was great. Um, we, we had a text exchange. The freedom that you get from a private jet to Ibiza is so temporary. It's, it's fleeting. It is that, that trip there and the trip back that the hangover lasts longer than the, tri than the experience itself. And the emotional hangover of, I want to go back there I don't really know how I, I can't sustainably keep doing this. Can't uh, just essentially throw all responsibilities to uh, you know aside, and the the emotional hangover from whatever responsibilities you abdicated to go do that. It's this cocktail of misery um, versus the freedom that you would feel if you woke up every morning at the same time. The biological rhythm that you'd be working with. That's freedom. Not only is it in your control, can you do it every day, but every ounce of your DNA, of your bioelectrical rhythm, your circadian rhythm, is unlocked by setting that standard. That you will feel amazing 20 minutes after waking up every day. If you just do it eight days, by the ninth day, you won't need an alarm clock. Like That's freedom. And when you experience that, it's kind of like uh, you were talking about uh, drinking. I used to love uh, a glass here and there. And then it was through the aura ring. It saw like, man, it's decreasing my sleep by 20%. Um, and the, the stats now, I know the research that's in uh, Beyond Coffee and um, the book I published a few years ago that one drink on average decreases sleep quality by 23%, uh, two drinks up to 37%. I believe that. Because if, if I have one glass of red wine, I'll see you. You need me at two in the morning? Or do you need me at four in the morning or six in the morning? Because I'll be awake yeah. and I can talk to you. And I can have a full conversation. Ba, 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 ba. It's terrible for sleep rhythm. And it wasn't um, it wasn't a disciplined thing that I just decided to, to stop drinking. I also have one every once in a while. But it had nothing to do with discipline. It had everything to do with, man, my rhythm is so damn good the next day. If I don't have that drink. Don't I mean, you a have single to have something that, that you need a rhythm for? How do you feel about that? So, like, in other words... I, I want to talk to you about that because be, because you're an accomplished guy. You're you're always you're always doing something. Um, you're a very generous guy, but you're also accomplished and and you're pretty intense. And you you have it seems a mission to an extent. So you you have not stopped becoming. You, you're you're an investor. You listen to pitches all day long. You're you've you've probably developed some very good pattern recognition to see what's what's gold and what's trash. Um, even recognizing that most of the time you're nine times out of 10, you're wrong because that's the nature of investing in a startup or whatever it might be. But, but you, 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 you continue to do that. You continue to stay very busy. How do you justify that? How do you, why do you do that when you have enough money to stop? I am a total hedonist. It's just, and that's not a put on. It's, it just feels good. You just like doing it. 
it's like the choice of waking up every morning at the same time. Once it was a sleep doctor that told me that eight years ago. And um, best advice I, I ever got. Best people will, and there's always these round tables of people going around or I'm on some panel for startup uh, building or startup investing. And uh, they'll ask like, what's the best business advice, best advice you ever got? And I always say, it was a sleep doctor that told me to wake up every morning at the same time because one of the reasons I was drinking six, seven cups of coffee a day is because I was waking up at six, then nine, then eight, then five, then 10, then 11. So out of whack and my rhythm was totally, totally out of whack that I needed one, two, three, four cups of coffee before you know, 10 a.m. That, it, the choice to not drink was just it feels better. That's right. In that morning. That's right. To not drink. It it is discipline, total hedonistic. discipline. I don't like the word discipline. I don't like hard work. I like the idea that you you do things because there's more pleasure in doing that. Understanding it, will trump discipline every day of the week. It takes as much discipline to once you notice, once there is this understanding of man, I just feel fucking great when I'm waking up every morning at the same time. And okay, maybe you don't have an aura ring, but you just notice. I mean, uh, 23% less sleep. That's like losing an hour. You think you're getting seven, you end up with six because of that one beer, because of that one tequila to where it doesn't take, it's as much discipline to not walk in in oncoming traffic. Yeah. It actually, there's no effort to it. Yeah. It's, it's like the zipper example. It's not an effort to say, okay, let me actually attach this at the right point, get that foundation going. It is, it's hedonism, but with understanding, it's an understand. I mean, I'm an efficiency optimizer. It's just an efficiency thing. I really want to feel like I'm in a groove within 20 minutes of waking up. I learned that from a sleep doctor. I'll feel like I'm in a groove that will improve that business meeting You know, at 9. It's going to improve that strategic decision at 11. It's going to improve that that uh, judgment call of whether whether to hire this person or that per person at 2 p.m. with that foundational decision to wake up every morning at the same time that it is the you know it's the tide that lifts all, all it's kind of like so. where it's kind of like where you are where you are supposed to be right it's like i, I want you to expand on something because um alan watts uh i've been i've been i'm almost through you are the goats yeah. yeah you're it and he's fantastic uh yeah, if people ever want to start with alan watts uh, you're it is the audiobook compiled by his his son. It's about twelve lectures, and it's just a great selection of them. And yeah, audible I absolutely and love it. And he said something that I thought was really profound, and he said, um, "Any sensible person has to accept the premise that you cannot improve the world and you cannot improve yourself." Boom! It's like, what? Mm -hmm. Hold on. And it's like you can go into a room and try to turn everything top side up and think that you can do that. Good, good luck. Good luck trying to turn everything top side up. Because when you turn anything top side up, there's an upside down to it. And it's exactly like the part of you that is trying to improve yourself is the part of you that needs to leave yourself alone. Is, or is, yeah, he, he in that line of thinking, um, and that's what brought me to... This philosophy of Advaita Vedanta was three years in the, just the absolute head vice that I was in in running uh, my last company or two companies ago and um, the one where I got the heart condition. And I just came across this, a YouTube lecture by this guy, Alan Watts, and it was like layered over amazing trippy music. Click on it and I was like, man, who is this guy? I want to listen to another and another and another brilliant uh amazingly articulate erudite uh british melodic accent philosopher that happened to also just live in a time where he could record all of his lectures um and so i listened to thousands of hours of this guy and and then eventually got to I remember clicking on a long lost interview with Alan Watson and he mentioned his primary influences the year that he died he mentioned his primary influences at that stage in life and talked about this philosophy Advaita Vedanta and I was like oh shit I want to go he, he would talk about everything and he would never mention what he was he, yeah, he about, never did he was a I'm not a Zen Buddhist priest. I'm not a, not a Buddhist. Buddhist I'm not a priest yep. he, he knew would, he was a big Buddhist scholar Christian scholar I mean knew yep. everything yep and he but he would never mention what he was and so I, I was like oh he's going to dodge this question and he mentions this philosophy Advaita Vedanta I'm like dude I've heard thousands of hours of this guy his most famous book, the book, 
is all about Vedanta, but I, he, he, I think he mentions it twice in the book. Um, so I had missed it this whole time, and then I'm like, okay, I'm sick of going. I, between him, Ram Das, Terrence McKenna, these three titanic questioners on YouTube, they were always on, on repeat in, my, in our house. And, uh, and so I got to the point after thousands of hours, I'm not joking, three years, three, four hours a day. It was, it was, it was, it was my therapy. It was my, uh, spirituality. It was my philosophy. It was my, um, uh, my outlet from my day to day. And it was an obsession. And I got to the point where I was like, okay, I had already been thinking I've gone a mile wide and inch deep. I know a little bit about all of these different philosophies. Um, and, and our dad had raised us with these books around the house, uh, like, Buddhist Christian, uh, how to be a Christian Buddhist. And I remember seeing these things. He listened to Alan Watts. It's so funny because I remember telling him to turn the shit off when I was probably didn't use those words when I was like eight, nine, 10, because it was just so boring. I wanted to listen to music. Yep. He was never listening to music. He was always listening to things like this or Ram Dass or Tony Robbins. So it was hilarious that come full circle when I'm in just the wheel of suffering and I am finding so much a relief from listening to a different perspective in life. So that's how, all it yeah, is. So how, and so okay, anyhow, on. just that's a, there's a little background on him and background on how I got into Advaita Vedanta. This was uh, eight so years So what does that now. mean to you when he says you, sh you, you, you should learn not, you can improve yourself, right. you can improve the so world. So he's, he's saying Do the reason you want to improve yourself is the reason you can't. <laughs> so you can't improve yourself because the reason you want to is the obstacle to you improving yourself. And what, uh, what he means by that, in other words, is you want to change some aspect about you so that you can get more from the world. You might think it's high-minded. Like, man, I want to become just less selfish because you know your selfishness is causing some, let's say, uh, disarray domestically, some tension at home. You're just not getting something. You're not getting something. Or at work, you get the, the feedback that you're not looking out for your coworkers or what you did was so self-serving. So you say to yourself, you, maybe you repeat this to yourself a handful of times, this seemingly noble cause of, I want to be less selfish. I want to start thinking about people more. Peel that back one layer deeper so that you can get more. That might be the root of it. One of the mo more selfish things you can do is this one last unlock to get even more respect at work, to jive better at home or with your friends. Like, ah, oh, shit, that was really selfish. And I want to change that about myself so that I can accumulate more. And that's what he's saying is the reason you can't improve yourself is because just under that thing that you think is improving yourself um, is what needs to is what, is needs, what needs to, to improve, <laughs> yeah, which is to let go essentially, and and the same goes with when you want to change the world. It's like you see this all the time. You see people go, and we all fall into this. They're bad guys over there. We have to go kill those bad guys, or get rid of those bad guys, or neutralize those bad guys, or get in the way of those bad guys. Um, and the idea is, you're you're one man's it, it's like one man's hero is another man's villain mm -hmm. and you are you are adding more suffering to the world you're still killing people over there you're killing bad guys who have families and things like this so so whatever you're doing is just keeps the cycle going oh, it's, it's like it's, protesters um in the streets they are creating the very thing that they're protesting against and they don't know it they're what are you seven, six seven years more. behind i mean the riots in santa monica so we moved to santa monica Four years ago, two weeks after the riots, the if you BLM want to riots or the uh, the uh, the uh, going down Main Street, breaking windows, yeah, during George, the, George the, uh, Floyd, yeah, yeah, George Floyd and uh, Black Lives Matter movement. If you want a very quick way to get people off your side and secretly put up the their little uh, I don't know mail slot flag that they're looking for some opposing movement against your movement, go have a violent protest where you're breaking windows on Main Street for the shop owner that you know and now in an eight block radius of the people that know and love that shop, know the shop owner, to turn on your movement and to put up their hand of like, hey, 
I don't need a movement tomorrow, but I'm kind of looking for one eight months from now, three years from now that opposes the movement that you're protesting for. That's a quick way to do it. Same thing for, I mean, we obviously saw it in Afghanistan. It's, you're going to create the enemy. And Alan Watts talks about this. Um, and in, in kind of a broader, higher level view, a higher uh, level view, he says, um, the person that's going to end the world by pressing a button is going to do it thinking they need to do it before someone else does. Yeah. Yes. So the person that is going to end the world, the mistake of all mistakes, is going to do it by pressing a button thinking they need to do it before someone else does. That's right. That, that, I want to get into AI with that, but I want to button this particular, this particular conversation about taking action to improve your life. Because uh, you said something that I thought was really profound and I want to read it to you. So I sometimes, I've been at this a long time, I, I'm, I'm doing well, but then I have friends that are not doing as, uh, that are doing way be better than I am. And I've never been a jealous person, but I, I get, um, I tend to feel as though I, I have four children now, soon to be for another child, and I get really worried about money. And I really get really, I get anxious that I'm not going to be able to provide for them. And I, I get anxious that this isn't going to keep going. And like all well, of us. That's all of us. That's all of us have us, to constantly right. hustle. But also you want to stay relevant because to be not relevant is to die, especially in my business. Comedy and stand-up. How many tickets are you selling? I mean, it's all this crazy stuff that goes on. And I, I texted you and I don't know why. I was just feeling, I was feeling, I never feel this way. It was very uncharacteristic of me to feel um, not jealous, but, but, anxious at someone else's success that I feel that I kind of came up with some of these people and I feel like I should have a little bit of it. Mm. You know, I have a great deal of trouble, not, and this is me. I have a day, great deal of trouble, not comparing my relative decline to many of my friends who have had a meteoric rise, especially since COVID. I know what the, the Vedanta says, but so, but it's sobering, uh, but it's something I've been reflecting on. And it's the acceptance of my place and perhaps even my destiny. Hard not to hold this at the forefront when one has children to provide for, etc. Obviously, my problems are high class and I'm doing fine, but it's still a difficult consideration to delete. LOL. I put LOL because I don't want to sound too heavy. Mm. And you said this is such a worthwhile reflection. Comparison is the thief of joy, but even knowing that does not mean we don't invite the thief in for dinner nearly every day. Suffering leads to salvation. External success so often leads to suppression. You are only in chapter three of your story, the very beginning of the story. And so are they. There are one million ways. I thought this was so great. There are one million ways you could ruin your children's lives by hitting every success metric you outlined for yourself. Hmm. Dude, that hit me because it's so true. I'm the man. I'll say it again. I'm there the are man. one million ways you can ruin your children's lives by hitting every success metric you outline for yourself. And I said something like, this is so true, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and I think you said, gratitude and desire cannot coexist. You fucking swami. I'm the man. Bro. I'm a good guy. I'm a good guy. No, that's not no, the point, man. Don't actually, take that. No, let, I, everything that I ever, and I've got a, a podcast that I started two months. I switched my business podcast. I love it. Know I this, listen to your podcast. To, to a, a philosophical podcast two months ago called The Daily Vedantic. Sure is a total curveball for everyone that was listening to my podcast. It went from like 9,000 subscribers, uh, and that's big for you know startup Silicon Valley podcast on YouTube too. I don't know, three, four views, and I do not care. <laughs> I love because you, it's the I'm only, one of those views. Dude, I, 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 I check yeah, in I'll, with it every day. I'll, 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 yeah, you you are one of those views. And and I I really didn't care because it's it's a reflect, it's a day to, re, or it's a time during the day for me to reflect on these these philosophical tenets. But one of the things that I say in those episodes is, dude, I am a, you know, you have a DJ playing other people's songs. I am a philosophical jockey, just playing other people's hits. And it's 99% of the time, 95% of the time, it's this, it's in terms of continuous study, this is the oldest philosophy known to humanities is Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta, which means non-dual end of knowledge or non-dual end of the Vedas, these four textbooks, oldest philosophical textbooks in the world called the Vedas. And the philosophical portion is at the end of it. So the philosophy is called Vedanta. 
and uh, Advaita, sometimes used, sometimes just chopped off, and it's Vedanta for shorthand. But everything that I say to people, what what I just or what I uh, I texted you, and I don't I don't even remember what uh, I'll text to people in in scenarios like that. But it's it's always playing the hits within this philosophy that is. I'm convinced 100 years from now, it will be the world philosophy because it, it, like investing in startups, when I started to look at this philosophy that I didn't, I never heard about until I was 30, but Alan Watts studied it every day. Carl Jung studied it every day. Um, you have uh, Aldous Huxley studied it every day. J.D. Salinger, Thoreau, Emerson, Joseph Campbell, all of these titans. Monsters. That were Monsters. literally like that was my pantheon. Each one, I probably had... A couple of years of my life with each one sitting at, in the Me too. the driver's seat. And then I'm like, how the hell have I never heard of the thing that, that these they guys all-, all studied daily? And and I got to the point, especially after a few years, where I was like, okay, it's tantalizing to just keep going with Alan Watts. But maybe I should go to the source material, especially once I heard Jung was a Vedanta as well. I, I, like, didn't know, I didn't know Jung was. Yeah, so, and he was... I get that he was maybe in a position where John Verveke, uh, a friend of ours that we've um, that uh, you've met before, podcast. yeah, he he talks about uh, he hypothesized why Jung never really talked about Vedanta. He kind of the uh, the uh, kind of capitalized s self lowercase s self higher self lower self. That's all Vedanta. Introvert extrovert all Vedanta. Um, collective consciousness all Vedanta. But there are many hypotheses of why he never. Uh, gave credit to uh, the philosophy that he was taking this from, and and maybe it's it's uh, a noble thing. He just didn't want to introduce the Eastern philosophies in a Western academic um, mm. environment. Yeah, or I have don't never think it, it, would have, it wouldn't have been accepted back then. Right, so he would it, have been thought of as a quack. Right, and so there's maybe there's really good reasons if he just wanted people to to listen and not get the. I mean, I I, I think I had this reaction as well of just like wait. He's, it, it, so Vedanta sits at the source of nearly all Eastern philosophy. About a thousand years later, Hinduism gets built on top of it with a bunch of rituals and and uh, and a bunch of kind of culture type of uh, cruft layers. Then you have Buddhism. As Hinduism, as the adage goes, Buddhism is Hinduism made for export. So as it leaves India, enters China, it gets distilled down, crystallized uh, philosophy and Buddhism. Then you have Zen, and then leaves China, enters Japan. But you follow it all back to these four textbooks, the Vedas. And I remember having this a similar reaction just to uh, cut, not like Jung needs to be cut any slack, but uh, thinking when I first heard about this stuff, I was like, I don't know, man. Tied to Hinduism has 3,000 gods because we were all fed the characterized, yeah. Yeah. Car- characterized version of Hinduism in you know, eighth grade when we spent a week studying it. But uh, So maybe that's why. But the... The long story medium is I went, I found out uh, that these Joseph Campbell, he was initiated Vedanta in Vedanta Society of New York. So I got it at uh, about 30. I was like, all right, I want to study what they were studying each day. And uh, so that's a little bit of, of the background of why I started uh, to study it. But the heart of this, of uh, this entire philosophy, it gets to that, that quote of Alan Watts of, if you want to, if you want to improve yourself, this is how, mm. and it's the same. Well, if philosophy you want to improve for, yourself, it's a, it's a form of letting go of any kind of attachment. D- yeah, it's right. a, it is through detachment. It's through understanding. Explain that too, because when people say attachment, I'm attached to my children, you know. But 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 explain. Yeah. Like, it's like what is talk that? about creating the thing you least want. It's our attachment. So there's a quote within within Vedanta of attach you lose, detach you gain. And by the way, uh, Vedanta, another word for Vedanta is eternal principles, sanatana dharma. So it's just these principles that you could apply to your life. Maybe there's, uh, there's out of 25, maybe there's four that you're like, oh shit, that's, that's helpful. It's totally like a buffet as opposed to growing up Catholic. We're yeah. told not to be like uh, you know, buffet Catholics taking and leaving things. You're supposed to take it all. With Vedanta, maybe you pick up one principle and this might be it. And you're like, holy shit, that helps me and that's all I needed. But the phrase is attach you lose, detach you gain. So I remember hearing that for the first time, thinking, well, I want to gain. I want to gain things. Now that's attachment. <laughs> oh, so it's, I guess this is saying, and let me entertain this idea, kick the tires. Questions are sacred within this philosophy, so you're supposed to question everything. And this phrase is saying, attach you lose, detach you gain. If I'm attached to something, I'm gonna lose that's going to make me lose it. 
The reason it's I'm almost attached- like I gotta be attached to be a, that's what's so crazy. I don't, so I was like, I should actively try to stay attached so I, so I lose it, so I gain it. I should be attached to, maybe you wanna be attached to your children or what you really wanna be attached to. You wanna be attached to gain, to gaining itself. Oh, well, paradoxically. The well, that's thing why, I need to attach that's why to with this is kind this of concept philosophy. of detachment. But just to yeah. round out that, that question, so you're attached to your children, which m many parents are. Um, you don't want to lose them, so you hover over them. You become a total pest. Uh, you're at, at 13, they're, they can't wait to go to college across the country. You're creating the relationship dynamic that you're makes them want to leave. You're smothering them. Smothering them, and no, no biological <clears throat> structure wants to be smothered. Um, it's antithetical to, to literally their, their DNA. You're creating that dynamic that's going to make them want to go to college halfway around the country. Maybe check in with a text here and there, but that attachment and that smothering is creating the, the, very, the very scenario you're trying to avoid. I think that might be why my, my marriage works so well. With, I'm, I'm just older than my wife, and I don't want to win any arguments with her. I don't. She's right more than I am. You know, people say this, but I really admire the shit out of my wife. I have to say, if there's anybody who's way closer to the Vedanta than I am, it's my wife. I'm far away. Danny's awesome. Yeah, she's, she's but she's just somebody who has faith that no matter what's going on, especially if it's bad, that it's good. Like, like literally, like she's like, like the minute I fucking complain or I'm not grateful, she just rolls her eyes like, God, you just don't get it. And I, you know. I, I I was in Florida. We bought a house there. It's a rental property. She bought it. She made she sold her house and made money, and so she she bought the house. And um, but we were married, so she, and, and I, I we're there at this community. And most of the people probably make eighty grand a year or whatever it is, and they have their children and they have their community. I've never met more happy people in my life. I've never met happier people. I've never met psychologically more healthy people. I've never seen more kids on their bikes or with a ball in their hand or playing and their parents watching, laughing, and hanging out than I, I did there. Mm. And, I, and, I, and I live in a, in a town where you got to make all the money right now or you're going to die. And I looked at my wife and I said, this is so embarrassing. I said, man, you don't need a lot of money to be happy. Now I know that intellectually or i've said that before but i don't believe it because i've been living here for too long well and she looked at me and she goes she's 34 she goes brian you're growing up <laughs> i was i'm embarrassed to say it it made i was like oh fucking right you know you want to be the guy yeah. who's got wisdom but boy you can get caught up and that's that's such a beautiful reflection just like the reflection you sent me via text because that is the beginning of, of growing up is, is feeling I get humbled by whatever work thing happens in a day, whatever family thing happens in a day, where you have this space of I don't need to have the answers. I don't need to be grown up just because I'm, you're uh, 112. Me? Yeah. Okay, so I don't appreciate that. I don't like dude, that, dude. Just I, because no, you're 119 years no, old no, no, doesn't no, mean you need to have okay. all of the answers. So I'm 57, but you, have oh, you seen sorry. me move? Have that's, you seen me that's move? That's true. I, I can't Bro. base it on movement. Movement, yeah, you, my do, you are stupid. like 19. My spine is are, fucking... Do yeah. I even have a spine, bro? Vibrant. You know what I'm it's, saying? Yeah. I mean, I'm... Courage wise, I got a spine and a lion heart. But Amen. the way I move, it's like, is this guy made of fucking cartilage and muscle? Yeah, I'm a tuna. Yeah, well... Yo, that's uh, in that, that episode with Eric Prince, he talks about hardware. You got, you do have great hardware. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your heart is, I don't know, nineteen. If your yeah. your body might be one nineteen, but that that idea of I'm fifty six and I'm not grown up yet. That is that's obviously the beginning. So wisdom in Vedanta is um, it is defined as the capacity to see the end and the beginning. Yeah. And this is another knowledge bomb where it hit me. I was like. Where has this shit been my whole life? I've never heard these knowledge bombs before, but the, de the so definition, true. my favorite definition of, of wisdom, the capacity to see the end and the beginning. So if you... Before you start something, can you take see a look where at it's how gonna it's going to go. Gonna go. Yeah. Can you see where it's going to go? Look at that girl. Right. I want to drink tonight. All those things. How's that going to go? Right. Follow that through. And that this place that you, you can get to where your, your mantra is, I don't know, allows you to... 
be 56 and you're in Florida and you're like, oh shit, I might not know what it's happiness consists of. It's very consists free. Of. But they, yeah, I used to. But, but do you do, use this in business all the time? Like you I, have to. It's, it's like, uh, well, you, so you're a huge UFC fan and it would be like um, knowing jujitsu and asking someone to use jujitsu when you're in the ring. It's, it's the most versatile of all of the frameworks to approach business life. I mean, everything that you, that you've touched that we've touched on, there's a Vedantic principle for it. So yes, I, I use it all the time. And in the midst of a conversation, I'm probably reflecting on 12 different principles, but uh, one of which that you, you touched on of happiness. It reminds me of a story I used to, so I studied development economics and worked on the ground in poverty alleviation in South Africa for two years outside of college. And I remember working in the townships there. So it's, you know, this, these are the slums, calm townships. Dangerous. Uh, but they're slums of Cape Town, the uh, most violent uh, city and one of the top three most violent cities in the world. At that time, I think it was the most violent. Um, and, and I would and you walk lived around. There? Yeah, lived, I lived in Cape Town, worked in the township. So yeah. the commute into the townships each day. And I remember obviously having the same uh, mental image that you might have right now or listeners might have right now if you're going into uh, destitute poverty and crime and, and total maybe uh, depravity and, and unhappiness. The people there were happier than the neighborhood we live in in Santa Monica. I went into Soweto. Yeah. They told me I wasn't supposed to go. Mm-hmm. But I talked to a couple South Africans and this driver took me in there. Mm-hmm. And he goes, it's fucking, you know, you hear this shit. It's like I hear Los Angeles. Are there gangs everywhere? Right, I go, right. no. I go into like the area that tourists are not. They were the, they, they, it's like, first of all, it's people living their lives. Mm-hmm. If I guess if you fuck around or you're, yeah, I mean, I, whatever. But if you go in there with an open heart and you're going in there during the day and you're eating the food and you're talking right. to people, they're not killing you. Right. And that's not how no, it works, and, dude. And it's, it was, it was so, it was so. Beautiful because it, day, they, it, this wasn't like I toured through it and I saw some smiles. Day after day of working there, I saw just the the baseline of happiness it was so much higher than anywhere that I had lived before and have lived since. And I remember, and the, the reason this comes to mind is I was working that nonprofit job, which paid nearly nothing, and I had to have a second job uh, to cover my rent. And it was uh, as a waiter in Cape Town. And so I'm working two jobs, and, and this woman, um, she had Sibo Ngile, Sibo. She had no idea that I was working two jobs, but I'm running around uh, the back of the restaurant taking you know, orders from the kitchen to the tables, and she's sitting on, I don't know, a stack of, of boxes. She's just sitting there with, you know, instead of a smoke break or coffee break, she's just sitting there with some tea. And she's probably maybe 40, and I'm 22, 23. And she just looked at me, and I'm just like, amped up probably starting my my coffee addiction uh around that time and she looked at me and she goes you white people you just love to work and i remember being it's you know when someone says something and there is no it's a round peg and there is no round hole for it to fit yeah it wasn't like it unlocked anything i was just like that was so absolute you candor and, and go, i'm like yeah. that what what do, what do you on? mean by yeah. that how does that how do i comp- how do i make sense of that and i grab the plates and i deliver them that night the next day two weeks later now it's you know 15 years 16 years later i'm still thinking about sibo saying you white people you love to work whether she was you know Correct across the board based on race. Who knows? But in well, that she, moment, she was I was talking, working two jobs. Yeah. I was, on, and on the side, I was building a startup. Yep. So I was essentially working three jobs. It's how we are in this, it's, that's cultural and, and Western. Well, and I, I made sure that I had this really cool spot by the beach and a cool, a cool part of town that required me to work two jobs to pay that rent. I thought I was signing up for freedom of looking at the beach, looking at the water each day. I was signing up for two jobs. So that, that freedom I thought 
of that box, you know, that I thought I was checking of like, that's beauty. This is what others want, so I should want this too. Had this sick underbelly of never seeing it because I was working two jobs and essentially three because I was trying to get a startup off the ground so that I didn't have to rent by the beach, but then I could own by the beach. I'm going to build this, this tech company. And, uh, and it was just that encapsulated the contrast between Los Angeles and, and South, the, and South Africa and the townships was not just this level of work. It's we all signed these contracts. Of Something that's very hard for me to get used to, having grown up in the developing world for most of my childhood. So being born in the Philippines, living in India, living in Pakistan, living in Lebanon, living in Saudi Arabia. Um, what, what happens when you live in Saudi Arabia, for example, is that you're exposed to all different cultures. Because Saudi Arabia at the time, when I lived there, was a place where people from Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, India, Pakistan, um, and all these other countries, the Philippines came to work that was where the work was mm -hmm. and so i had an incredible childhood because from the age of 11 to 14 i used to sit in my kitchen and listen to all of them tell stories so we you, you would live in a compound in in back then you lived in a compound if you were an expat if you were if you were american or european you lived in a compound because there was nothing else and then they had the people from all over the world would work on that compound, that's where the work was. They would work for the multinational corporations. So there'd be a there'd be a chef, there'd be a driver because women couldn't drive. My driver, our driver was from Egypt because my mother couldn't drive. It was Saudi Arabia back then. Women weren't allowed to drive, so everybody had to have a driver because you could. It was, there was no Uber, no cabs. So you were assigned if you worked for a multinational company, they paid for a, your your transportation, a driver. So you had a, you had an Egyptian, you had um, you had an Af Afghan gardener. You had a, another gardener from Yemen. You had uh, uh, a woman who cleaned things from the Philippines. You had, uh, I'm going through everything, you had another person who was in charge of the staff from Sri Lanka. You had, so there, there was all these different cultures. And what was the common language? English. So I used to sit for hours in the kitchen. And everybody back then, so back then nobody sat in chairs. You would sit on the floor or you would squat and talk. That's why I can squat for hours. So you, they would talk and eat and talk, and I would listen. I was young, and I would listen to them tell stories. And one of the things that's impossible what an for— experience. Yeah, dude. So one of the things that's impossible for Westerners to get to understand and that they judge is that if you have somebody from the Philippines, you know, she could just—this woman, I remember, she could just sit. She would squat, and she could just do nothing. Mm. She could just stare. If you were in—if you watched the way the Arabs were, they would sit— and if they weren't communicating with each other, they were always together. Family was everything. You didn't get divorced. You didn't get divorced. You're, everybody lives together in a, in a community. It's why psychologically they're so healthy. So you, you but they, 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 it was very common to see people in those parts of the world be able to do nothing, be able to sit, stare, and do nothing, mm. and just exist and be. Now, to us, that looks like they're not reading, they're not being productive, they're not doing this. To them, they're just, they're experiencing something. They're just, they're not, they don't have to do anything. And that, that is impossible. We call that meditation here. Mm. And we talk about how impossible, you got to go on a retreat for that. Mm. But, and one of the things that, that um, Swami Parthasarathi Partha says is that it's, it's, it's difficult to be productive. So part of like what, what the East has mastered is the ability to do nothing and sit mm. and just be. And the West has, has mastered the ability to not be able to do that, but to be very productive and dedicate your whole life to work and build a skyscraper. There's a middle ground. Yeah. There's a fight. And you've, you've, That's you, right. you've, you've, there's the a middle ground. ground. And in both cultures take it too far. And they're obviously, uh, as a simplification, there are people that, that operate outside of these two poles. But yeah, in the East, there is relative peace, but no action. And, uh, and he says in the West, and if anyone's interested in this philosophy, the book, I think the, to read on this philosophy is Vedanta Treatise or, so um, or our daily podcast and Daily Vedantic to get uh, some of these, these nuggets and see if it's interesting to you. But the, um, you have the East where people are relatively peaceful but no action, and you have the West where people are relatively prosperous but no peace. And what we're seeking, all of us, at the core of everything that we're seeking, you might think it's the new car, you might think it's the promotion of the job, you might think it is the uh, spouse what we're all seeking, 
as philosophy says, is peace and prosperity. And not one or the other, but both. Peace and prosperity. Peace and prosperity. Yes. Not one or the other, but both. But both. And if you have, and it's, it takes 20, 30 seconds to think about the power of that, because if you have prosperity and no peace, well, who would want that? If you have peace, but you, are, you aren't able to provide for the people that you love, your children, who would want that? But you have these cultures that orient towards one or the other, and it's the rare individual that is able to attain both. But you cannot get to prosperity, long-lasting prosperity that you would want, without peace, because you might tap into it briefly and then lose it because of your lack of peace. And you can't get to long-lasting peace without that prosperity. It's one of the interesting things of the four aims in life in uh, these in Vedanta and uh, the Eastern traditions of Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. Truth, and then you can look at these in different, you can order them differently for each life, but people are looking for, and their aim is to find truth, economic uh, prosperity, um, comfort, and then you also have liberation. And you want all of them. They're, they should, you should have all of them, um, is their, their view. That is so different than out here where we just, we're like, what's the one thing? And this goes back to that point of peace and prosperity. Philosophers will say, well, you should have both. Prosperity isn't a billion dollars. Prosperity is, do your means supersede your desires? So you can either get that by upping your means or decreasing your desires. Peace is, does your understanding supersede your conflict? Mm. Not the other way around. If your conflict supersedes your understanding, that's not peace. If it is like, oh, I started my food truck and this is just so fucking unbearable. It's so hard. I don't understand what's... If you get in the cold plunge and you're like, oh my God, I can't do that. Seven seconds, get me out of this thing. Your conflict is superseding your, your understanding. If you do a cold plunge for two minutes and, and it's a trivial example, but it's a good example where once you understand, oh, I'm going to feel so good 15 minutes after this thing. You have an understanding and awareness of what hangs on the other side. So you're like, oh, I can pay for this conflict, this uh, inner conflict. Of, I should get out of this thing because my understanding supersedes it. Then you get that. 15 minutes later, you get that four-hour, six-hour bliss that comes from going into the conflict. The thing that you, a few years ago, or your neighbor would be like, why the hell would you go into that conflict? Because conflict on one level is peace on another. You cannot have peace without conflict. The, the harmony of your health right now is because your red blood cells are kicking ass. Your white blood cells are quite literally killing pathogens right now. That conflict on one level leads to peace on another. Mm. Peace is not the absence of conflict. Then you have prosperity. Prosperity, do your means supersede your desires? We in the West, we're like, what's the one thing? They're, it's... 8,000 years in, who knows how long it was as an oral tradition before it was ever written down. Thousands of years have gone into an understanding of, oh no, it's not just one, it's two, or the four aims. But here in the West, it's like, oh, get a billion dollars and you'll have everything. Yeah. And that's so laughable to someone that spent a few well, years thinking Well, I think also the, the people that, that um, really accomplished, so if you listen to the, the people, even including yourself, who've made a lot of money, um, whether it's Raval Navikant, uh, Naval Ravikant, or it's uh, Ray Dalio, whatever. They're actually... Ray they, Dalio studies uh, Vedanta as well. Does he? He does? He used to go and have, a, a, every year, go and see Swami. Okay, well, there you go. So there's Ray Dalio. That's a, and, the father, the uh, founder of the ashram and uh, the author of that book, Vedanta Trees, is this uh, Swami yeah. Parthasarthi. And, and there you go. So 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 you've got Ray Dalio. And, and you know... Um, what one of the things that I think is is interesting about when you talk to people that are extreme winners or who do really well, so Kobe Bryant, it was like Kobe Bryant. They said, you know, he said people think I'm I'm driven to win or I'm I'm driven not to lose, and that's not actually what drive drove him. And I don't think that's what drives successful people. Um, rather, there's a middle ground, which is this: I'm just trying to figure something out. 
I, I'm just interested in how deep I can go Driven to understand. with the game of basketball. How innovative can I be? I don't write stand-up to be super popular or make money. I'm writing stand-up. I'm doing stand-up. Like I'm really excited about my next special So I, that because I want to see if I can surprise myself. I think I know what I'm doing. I think I have a story to tell. And I, and I, and I think that there is a theme to it that I've never thought about before, but I'm discovering it. So what drives me is a process of discovery. And I think what, dro what drives great investors is a process of discovery. It's like Raval Navikant talks about, uh, Naval Ravikant talks about that to, to, to some degree, which is like he was interested in science and he was interested in statistics and he loves technology and he likes to play with these things. And what he means by play is it's a process of discovery. What can I figure out when I do this? You're going to make a lot of money. That The money is a byproduct. But the idea that I'm going to be a billionaire, if, if that's the goal, I suppose you can reach that. But I don't think you're going to really build true acumen and understanding and expertise without the curiosity that comes with. When I talked to Joe Rogan and I were talking about what, when he just signed this deal, we were, I was, he started to try to, I, I said, you know, we were kind of examining what makes him so successful and what separates him. And then I kind of stopped the conversation. I said, this is not, um, there's no way to describe why you're successful. My, my guess is it's something in the area of the fact that you're very honest and you're always in a process of saying, wow. Mm. He's just always, he just, he just loves talking and learning. That's always been the motivation. The money's great. It just came. The fuck you money just came where he himself is surprised by it. Like, he's like, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But that's never been what, that he's never thought about, I can tell you he's never thought about money. I, well, I've known him when he was 27, he was making crazy money as, a, as an actor and a comic. He never thought about it. He would just spend it. It never, it, just, it wasn't the point. The point is, it, all that mattered to him was getting better at jujitsu, getting better at stand-up, and getting better at, you know, at, at that stuff. He just was trying to figure the game out. Yeah, well, that's, that is a, if I remember correctly, he, he didn't grow up with money. No. So him getting to a baseline uh, or exceeding that baseline of desire where he's like, man, this is all house money. This is more than I ever dreamed. Yeah. That's a, that's, that's a benefit of growing up without a crazy high watermark of, I need to get back there just to have the lifestyle that my parents, just to give my kids that lifestyle. So that's one of, one of the million ways you can ruin your children. Mm. You accidentally give them a baseline that at 20, 24, 28, they realize, oh shit, I probably am not going to get back there. And, and that instead well, or, of or, playing or with house just, money and, and you're just ahead of the eight ball, you just feel like you're 20 miles behind the eight ball. But to, uh, to yeah, round out, uh, what, uh, you know, we touched on, um, the townships and Santa Monica, the root of that satisfaction or the higher baseline of satisfaction and happiness in and peace um, in that violent neighborhood, that peace within that, the smiles, the baseline warmth and happiness that existed there that's higher than Santa Monica, less desire. And Naval has this great, this great quote of, um, he says that uh, unhappiness is a, uh, how does he, I want to I want to get it exactly right, so I'm not uh, just paraphrasing it, but he says, I'll have to paraphrase it. He says, um, unhappiness is a contract, how does it, how does it go? Contract you make with, you make with yourself until you get what you want. So unhappiness is what you sign up for when you say, I'm going to have, I'm going to be unhappy until I, I, I get what I want. talking about this. Yeah. $10 million milestone in your bank. Until I get 10 million in the bank. Until I get a million. Until I get that promotion. You're signing the contract to be unhappy until you get what you want. That thing that you desire, that high watermark, I got to get back to this, you know, the success that my, my dad had. To get respected by him also, just to get all those things that we had growing up. To feel my self-worth. You sign this contract implicitly, unconsciously mm -hmm. to all of us. I'm going to be unhappy until I get back there, until I get there for whatever you know, promotion. We're signing contracts to be unhappy all day long. 
because of our desire. This obviously ties to the Buddha's noble truth mm. of all life is suffering. It's the first noble truth, the second noble truth. Oh, Vedantins are often called crypto Buddhists. Buddhists are often called crypto Vedantins because oh, it's yeah. so similar. The second noble truth is um, all suffering comes from desire. So why, what's the, what is the lopsidedness? Why is one neighborhood happier? Why is that neighborhood in Florida feel happier than you know, your neighborhood in, in Manhattan Beach? Except it makes no sense except for maybe there's uh, just a lower threshold of desire. And there's a crazy, obviously, I mean, people are moving halfway around the world or halfway around the country to L.A. because of some super high watermark they've, they've set for themselves or yeah, somebody said, that, once, once somebody said that about LA. It's a, it's a, a town full of people climbing, climbing this wall, and they get to the top and they realize it was the wrong wall, or they don't like the view. Uh, reminder, guys, I will be um, at uh, the Louisville Comedy Club March one and two. If you're in Bakersville, California, February twenty third, you come see me and Sam Tripoli uh, do some stand up, and then I'll be down in Long Beach or Huntington Beach, I think, at the Rec Room. Uh, February 24th with Sam Tripoli. I think two shows, maybe one show. I don't know, bro. Can't stop, won't stop. Then Louisville Comedy Club, March 1 and 2. And then you know what? I go to Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm, I'm doing that comedy Tulsa club. Tulsa time. I'm going to Tulsa, March 8 and 9, right? I don't give a shit. I keep going, all right? So if you want to laugh hard for over an hour and learn and learn, come check me out. All right, back to you. I got to get you out of here. I think we've covered all the bases. Um, but um, can, you, can you just, as somebody who's probably invested in AI, and you know Sam Altman, I think, who also practices Vedanta? He does. So yeah, Sam which, Altman, which was a surprise. It was a huge surprise to me when he, uh, he tweeted that out about a year ago. I'm telling you, it's going to be the philosophy of How about of that? Future. Sam Altman also studies Vedanta. Um, can, can you, uh, I'm, I'm afraid of, I'm very worried about AI. I'm worried that AI is making AI. I'm worried that, um, human beings are no longer going to be useful. I'm worried that, uh, that we are creating these AI brains that are going to become sentient hmm. and that there's no governor and no stopping this. And it's a little bit like a nuclear arms race. Do you worry about that? No, I don't. Hmm. I don't, and and I see the the worry. You know what's interesting is um, spending a decade in in Silicon Valley and seeing. So the, there's three pra daily practices. I promise the relevance of this uh, will be clear, but there's three daily practices within Vedanta. If there's anything, I'll I'll shove into a conversation. It's points on Vedanta. But the three daily practices are question everything, don't take anything for granted, and study and reflect daily. So, yeah, you have that lunch with a friend, you can easily get your entire world hijacked because they just, I don't know, they made 20 mil last year. And you're like, what the fuck? I thought I was above this. Now I need to figure out what are they... I gotta go and, get, make money. And if you don't study and reflect, you could study uh, St. Augustine, you could study Socrates, you could study, you know, Descartes, as I like to say. Socrates um, and Des Descartes. And you could study any, any philosophy you want, um, but study something timeless. Study something over a thousand years old. And if you don't do it daily, then it, when you do it, it's like a grounding wire. For that lunch, five hours later, you have that grounding. You go three, four, five days, 30 days, four months from this stuff, you're just going to get your, your, uh, your thinking. You, you will start to outsource your thinking. Um, the, the second practice each day is uh, to not take anything for granted. So it's so interesting um, within my conversations with people down in LA, they're so scared of AI. And I think in general, over the last 10 years, they're like anything Silicon Valley they hate because I don't know, they grew up their whole life thinking this was the, well, there was the a Mecca. Well, there was a Rogan podcast with uh, Tristan Harris and uh, Reza Raskin, Ezra Raskin, yeah. who created Infinite Scrolling. Do you know those guys at all? Um, Tristan is, I mean, he's, let's put it this way. I think it was Nassim Taleb that said, never trust anyone who makes a salary and never trust anyone in their field who makes a salary in that field. So you might not trust me because I, I've invested in AI startups. And in fact, just the default would be to not trust me. 
Tristan is literally compensated for how much fear he drums up. The he bank is. account, the yeah, his bank account goes up with each click that and as an ethicist, each um, fear mongering uh, impression he gives on the world, his spheres radius of of influence goes up. So he is he is he increasingly seems like a good compensated. Guy. Are you saying that he 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 may have that internal well he's got subconscious bias or? he's it, not internal it's just his salary his compensation um is directly correlated to how much fear he is i won't say drumming up but talking about on these podcasts that's not and that's not a slight nor is that some it's just uh, a fact yeah that's not just a subjective viewpoint that is a fact yeah um the reason you click on it is not because he's talking about the uh the upside to ai um, right. You click on it because you want to hear it about the ten percent chance that uh, it destroys the world, and um, and that ten percent is so pulled out of thin air. This is in a in a, a book called Precipice, where I will say we should be thinking about AI way more than we're thinking about climate change. Yeah. Um, because of the this this book Precipice, uh, it it does talk about this direction um, of climate change having a chance in uh in catastrophe in a global catastrophe that uh decimates the population by 90 percent in the next hundred years something microscopic it's something like fraction of a percent and this book out of thin air consults some experts says ai is 10 percent chance that's a good call to arms of we should be discussing this because it is 100 times more it, the amount of structural conversation and structural resources going to climate change is uh, is way kind out. Of, yeah, is kind out of, of proportion to what should out be going of proportion to AI. is kind of uh, yeah, exactly out of whack versus how important AI is. But I just look at it as the there is an immense responsibility for us to develop AI properly. But I look at what we have a chance to improve. It is, we will look back and say 2024 was still the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages did not end in 1750. <laughs> the amount of unhappiness that exists in the world, which we've, we've touched on, especially in developed countries, which we also touched on. So even that, that statement of like a township versus Santa Monica, this is uh, well born in the data. This is not just like uh, one guy's um, experience. The rate of depression climbing in developed nations, climbing faster than in developing nations, should have us all worried that our current trajectory is making us less happy. It's causing internal, we are living another kind of like thing to question. We think that there's, um, I don't know, a whole lot of violence happening in the world. We are living in the most peaceful time in human history. That's right. But what is so interesting is since I think it was around 2015. 2015, uh, there were more deaths caused by self-harm than all violence, conflict, or criminal combined. I believe it was 2015. Meaning that we are closer to world peace than we are to inner peace. And that inner peace I think we are still on the very, the, in the very beginning of the story of inner peace getting obliterated. That inner the feeling, you know, what we feel in LA of this place is so expensive. You know, people are clinging tooth and nail just to survive here, just to um, survive peacefully here because everything is so damn expensive. In our current trajectory, LA is just a leading indicator for what the rest of the world is going to become. Um, I hear about it in everybody moving from LA to Dallas. Dallas is where I'm from. You now everybody's talking about in Dallas how expensive everything is. They kind of are claiming it's California uh, driving up the home prices, and it doesn't seem to be just California. Um, it is a lot of foreign investment driving up uh, sure. the home prices. This this contagion of desire and our level of desire outstripping our means comparison is the thief of joy and all of us inviting that thief in for dinner every night it is not a contagion that's just gonna sit in los angeles 
it is taking over the West by storm. And you go to India, try to go there once a year, and it is absolutely wrecking shop in India. Really? No one pays it. No one pays attention to their philosophical roots in India. Very few. Because very it's few just people. all about making a dollar bill. Oh, when I tell them, I'm, I'm an investor in 20 companies in, in India, young startup founders. When I try to tell them about their own philosophical they, roots, they can, they're like, they're like ah, okay, I, can you help me raise my Series A? <laughs> I go, oh, okay, yeah, I just, we need to hire a COO. Or they're freaking out, especially in the last two years when there's been um, a lot of uh, fallout within tech investing. They're freaking out. And they're like, they're the zipper's halfway up and they're just asking, how do you jam these teeth yeah. of the zipper closed instead of uh, a foundational conversation? So it's taking over the world. Um, AI has a chance to provide un Thinkable prosperity, really unthinkable prosperity really? to the world. It's, well, it's think about so, it. So, so meaning. Here's, yeah, here's so, an example. So this yeah. this phone in my pocket, and this is what I think about is the immense upside, um, and I just find it so interesting in LA. It's so I think it is collectively pessimistic because they don't get to benefit from it, or they, there's this view that's going to take something from them uh, more than maybe more than any city in the world um, because of IP rights, because of uh, just the culture of creativity down here. And some of that, um, I think, is, is warranted. But you go to a township in, in, uh, in Cape Town, South Africa, where they have no like dog in the fight, um, and I look at the fact that they don't have, many of them don't have running water, they don't have real electricity, an electrical grid, it's all um, bifurcated from people's uh, plugs. Um, and I look at something like the good that Google did for that community. I mean, right now, today, uh, someone in the slums of Rio de Janeiro with the smartphone in their, in their pocket, an Android phone with access to Google, has more information in their pocket than the President of the United States 30 years ago. That's someone that might make less than $5 a day. Has more information in their pocket than the President of the United States 30 years ago. That is the upside of technology. You know, Einstein had this famous quote of, um, the only thing you need to know is where the local library is. Mm. Because that is the foundation, that foundational, uh, I don't know, zipper uh, that allows you to get everything else. Everything is, is seamless if you have that foundation. Now everybody has more than a library in their phone or in their pocket for free. AI, and, and people don't talk about that. Um, people don't talk about the upside of technology. Uh, Rarely do we ever talk about it. So in that first practice of question everything, just question these, these narratives. Question this, not just a narrative, but this position put forth that, hey, we're so good right now. Don't rock the apple cart with this AI stuff. We ain't that good right now. Right. Right. If we're closer to world peace than we are to inner peace, more people through self-harm, uh, through substance abuse, through suicide, are taking their own lives then all wars combined, we ain't that good right now. Mm. And there seems that there's, we're still prescribing the same medicines. If you were a, a doctor in 1998 and you left practice, you came back in 2024 and you're a psychiatrist prescribing medicine for mental health, you would be prescribing the same medicines Xanax. you were prescribing 26 years ago. The, uh, the lack of innovation in the place that we're skyrocketing in need and, and is this contagion that I think is only going to take over the world where we have uh, immense unhappiness, immense depression, mental, mental health uh, crises that become, and it already is, far more of a pandemic than COVID ever was. Um, COVID was a pandemic. But if we're looking at pandemics uh, based on numbers, then mental health crisis globally and especially in, in the U.S. where it's on the rise, it is so vastly under-discussed and under-researched. Um, under Something like AI, let's say it is, um, let's use a, a, a rare niche disease. Right now you might have 17 researchers working on it around the world. Mm. With the power of the internet, they get connected. That's great. With the power of AI, they could run, instead of 18 people running models, the hours in the day that they're, that they're awake, 
and each one is running their own model, you get 17. AI could run a trillion models in an hour. God. Turns those so, so 17 we're gonna see, researchers. We're going to see crazy developments. Crazy developments across healthcare, and, and across. I mean, this, I this device. I can't wait can this, grow hair and grow muscles. I'm going to be jacked with a mane. That's yeah, all I think about. In reverse age. I don't Let's give a shit about, yeah. About that I want my face tight. But I don't the, give a fuck about anything else because I the, study Vedanta. That's, yeah, that's right. Um, this, this device in my hand, the phone, there's about six people at Apple, six executives, the highest level executives that design how this phone should be built. Um, the chips, the, there's plenty, thousands of people that ladder up to those people. But the actual decisions of camera should go here, uh, glass should be this thick, battery should be uh, this size to, I don't know, find the intersection of the optimal weight of the phone, the optimal charge. It is ridiculous that we've been convinced to have these devices in our pocket that die within a day, um, and we're all fine with it. But those decisions, there's about six people that make those decisions as humans. This phone is about $1,000. With AI, this phone is going to be less than $10. It might be 10 years. It might be 15 years. But where they get the materials, the choice of materials, the choice in um, how, to ch how to build the chip, where to construct, where to put the cameras, what, what should be those hundred different parts to form that optical zoom within that camera will no longer be humans, just the equivalent of just putting their finger to the sky of like, well, I studied this, it should be this. It will, AI will run a trillion models in an hour and say, oh, well, with the uh, abundance of these resources, we obviously should prioritize uh, to make the prioritize a um, a schema that makes the phone this way, uses these inputs, um, uses this type of battery technology. That. That's how your hand holds. That's it. how your your hand would hold it. Um, it it should be and directly we'll in your have ear. Phones by yeah, then. it should be directly in your ear, and this is how you can make sense of you know a computational user interface with glasses in a way that right now there's like eight humans thinking, how can we put cameras or how can we put the right cameras and the right projection in glasses like Apple's uh, vision pro. And in 10 years, it's going to be uh, an AI, um, an AI powered design firm that is not only being used by Apple, but everyone can use it for this, podcast studio to help Dylan figure out, Oh, it should, I should be using these cameras, put them in this angle and the editing. Oh my God. It's happening as that, as the episode is happening or is, uh, yeah, is it's being recorded. It's, it is insane how we are living in the dark ages. We are basically still cave people drawing the Buffalo on the cave wall. We're just like, but that same, a, that a same photo technology and, it to and a, that same a brain can be used for destruction as well. It can also be used to thwart destruction. It can be used to thwart destruction. And I like and using the word thwart. It's, it's kind of fun to use thwart's the word thwart. Thwart's a great word, dude, that I forgot even existed until you just used it. It, it can be used to thwart destruction. In and fact, we're gonna, that might be the title of this fucking podcast. And I'm sorry I used the F word again. You know, it's, it, is, it is interesting that uh, for the first six months, the top questions that ChatGPT got were around <clears throat> what is the purpose uh, of living? What is the meaning of life? How do I find purpose? They were very philosophical. You'd have a long tail of questions like, how do I create a website for XYZ? You'd have a long tail of questions of, um, you know, can I take Advil when I'm, pregnant or things like that. But the most common questions were, what is the meaning of life? They're deeply philosophical. And that thwarting is how, I mean, that's philosophy, therapy, religion. The commonality between the three of those is how do I thwart self-destruction? So this, not that's only is true. AI, that's AI. True. How do I get better? How do I avoid self-sabotage? Where, where do I find help? Yeah. And, and the idea that we won't use AI to help thwart 
destruction, thwart. It's crime. antithetical it's, to it the is, human experience. And it's so antithetical to exactly how, I mean, the commercial opportunity to, um, to decrease crime in, in every city using AI to decrease or improve the efficiency uh, improve the trust of Will it help my police? karate is really the question because I'm it, always thinking about how it can improve my karate. And because karate is... Dude, that's another... Answer. It should be karate. Um, I yeah. guess you could maybe just pronounce well, it. But it's like when saying you Kung Munchen. Fu, when you've Munchen. Studied if Kung I said to you, dude, we're going to go to Oktoberfest and we're going to stay in Munchen, it makes no sense. Oh, you mean to use other, Yeah, Munich. We, but... We're back on the Ibiza, Ibiza train. And yet we say Ibiza. Makes no sense. But uh, keep going, karate. No, I was just saying that uh, when AI can help me with my kung fu and my karate, then you can come talk to me. In the meantime, all I hear is just ma, 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 ma. I'm not listening to anything you fucking say. Because for me, at the end of the day, it's about karate. It's about kung fu. Because I fight in the air. And it's ultimately when it goes to the ground... It's about jujitsu, but here's the catch. Here's the catch, bro. Fight never goes to the ground for me. I don't get it that far. I stop it. I thwart people's mm. ground game. I thwart them before they take me to the ground. Are you getting what I'm putting down, bro? I'm buying it wholesale. Yeah. I think I think this was one of my favorite podcasts, James, as you are one of my favorite people. And when I practice gratefulness, you're one of the people in my list. Well, the surface area of topics that you love to cover, and this must go back to your upbringing, and, and talk about not taking things for granted, that upbringing of seeing those different cultures, it is so much fun. This is why I have so much fun talking with you, because it's, it is, I mean, eyes roll back into heads with most of, even our mutual friends if the word God is up, is uttered. I know. And yet it's something that you... Um, well, for you and I, it's almost like the only with. thing worth talking about, this kind of stuff. So I, I appreciate it. And um, uh, I want to do this way more often with you because it's just a great excuse to hang out and get to what's important. Likewise, so, Brian, it's fun. Yeah, I'm going to let you go do your... Uh, go go be go do some Moglin. Because you, you... About you to Moglin. chat with a, a startup in India. Damn. Through the modern... Miracle of Zoom. I'm going to chat with a founder in India in about 20 minutes. It's, it's one thing to be uh, a, a, an American mogul. You, you international. You know what I'm saying, bro? You international. Why limit ourselves? We moguling out here. Mm. Okay? So I want to thank you for being a mogul and for Magic Mind and for uh, getting closer to God and bringing me closer to the truth. Let's just call it truth and beauty. You know what I'm saying? Indeed. In the meantime... Um, thank you, buddy, for having me. Let's rock and roll. Thank you very much. This was awesome. Awesome. Awesome.